Well, how human-like is God? When God says that he is our father, what exactly does that mean? Well, what does the Bible mean when God says that he regrets? Does that mean that he doesn't know the future? We're gonna hit more, all of that and more on this episode of The Unapologetic Show. Hello, Thinking Christians. Welcome to The Unapologetic Show, where we defend truth without compromise with Dr. Bobby Conway, the one-minute apologist. I'm your host, Tim Hall. Two quick reminders before we dive into our topic today. If you're checking this out on the radio, we would invite you to head on over to our YouTube channel and subscribe as we are trying to reach 100,000 subscribers before the end of 2022. You can check out our progress and you can be one of them by subscribing to our channel. Also, this is a listener-supported show. The show does not happen without people like you jumping on our financial support team. We're looking to raise $25,000 before the end of 2022. And you can join that support team by heading on over to our website, oneminuteapologist.com and click on donate. Any amount would help us reach our goal. So Bobby, we are going to dive into this topic. And this honestly came from a call that you got on the pastor's perspective. And somebody was asking this question about when God regrets, what does that mean? And so I think there's kind of this general sense, maybe in just, you know, West, the Western world, that God is more of like a superhuman, right? He's just, he's human, right? But he's just a little better human. He's like this <laughs> maximal human, right? And we see these characteristics kind of pointed out in, in Genesis. It says, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, talking about the flood story. Um, we see this another passage in uh, 1 Samuel 15, where it says, uh, and Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul and the Lord regretted that he had made king, made Saul king over Israel. So there's a couple passages kind of bring that out. Um, you know, and, and Matthew, right after the Lord's prayer, talks about how we shouldn't be anxious about anything and about how God is our loving father and he feeds the, the birds and, you know, covers the fields with flowers. And so, you know, how much more special are you? But then we look around our world and we see people starving. and not, So there, there, there's a couple different aspects that we're going to hit here. So let's just uh, <laughs> start with kind of this idea of uh, God regret. Does God have emotions? Like, how do we think about some of these regret passages, if you will? Well, that's a big question. And yeah. you'll end up with some people uh, with different opinions on this, right? Okay, let's, let's lay them out. It, it is <laughs> not surprising. Uh, when we think about God um, and his emotions, uh, you'll, you'll have some people that are worried about saying that God has emotions from the standpoint emotions um, that are changing mm. um, imply that maybe God is changing right. because he can be affected. Yeah. So you'll have some that would want to say, um, you know, God is not someone who experiences emotions like we do. So when what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Yeah. Uh, you, you will have uh, some theologians and philosophers say, well, it means that, you know, that we have mind and will and emotion, right? Like God, uh, you'll have others that would resist that. Uh, it's not that God doesn't experience emotions. Okay. I think that we would want to, to say that, but there's not this direct correspondence in how he experiences emotions like we do. Mm -hmm. Like our emotions are whimsical. Um, they can be, you know, untempered. They're they're neurotic at times. Yeah. Uh, we we also have to think of uh, it'd be real easy to picture God constantly like in an emotional state. Like yeah. like like we watch the news and we're overwhelmed, going, oh my goodness, like how does the Lord deal with this? I mean, if he's all knowing and he knows all that's going on, how in the world does he just not go emotionally crazy? Yeah. Well, maybe it would help us to think about the fact that if God's all knowing, that before he even creates the world in which all these incidences begin to happen that stir our emotions, uh, he already kind of, uh, you know, experienced them, so to speak, before yeah. these events were even created because mm -hmm. he knew what would happen. Right. So it's not like, okay, something bad happens to us on Thursday, and then God goes through this emotional, uh, you know, torment yeah, as right. a result. Yeah. Uh, he was aware of that before time 
even began. Mm. So uh, God is emotionally perfect. Uh, God is intellectually perfect. Yeah. Uh, we aren't in that way. So when the Bible talks about things like God's emotions, I think it's tough. You have some, uh, they would talk about God's divine impassibility. Mm. Uh, God's, uh, you know, God does not suffer. Um, now, the same person would want to say, in God's essential nature, in his divine nature, God does not suffer. But obviously, Jesus uh, assumed a human nature. Yeah. Therefore, that's how he relates to us. So, you look to the incarnation. Mm. You look to Jesus in that way as somebody who can relate to us, as somebody who experienced um, full-fledged human suffering. Mm. But on the cross, God didn't die, right? right? Jesus simply laid down the human nature that he assumed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that the human nature was laid down. So all that to say, you have those that are going to say that God is impassable, that he doesn't suffer at all. Then on the other, maybe extreme, you're going to have those that would say, uh, yeah, God's an open theist. And he's just learning as he goes along. Right. Right. He's changing his mind and he's ebbing and flowing. And then you'll have some that uh, that that they'll they'll be good with God's omniscience that He's all knowing, but they'll say there's that God does feel, uh, and we we need to be careful to not you know relegate Him to a place where we say He doesn't feel, He doesn't emote. Uh, the 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 fear of somebody who uh, believes in divine impassibility is they don't want to subject God to change. Right. 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 And so this is because. God is immutable. So God's immutability, his unchangeableness, is closely related to his divine impassibility. Mm. How, how much of these, uh, you know, particularly the regret passages, and we'll kind of get to some other categories, but the regret passages and the emotional passages are, you know, kind of the author, the, the one that's penning it. So God is the ultimate author, but with the one that's writing it down, kind of just working through where God's using that to relate. He's using relatable emotional language to that. Do you think that plays any role in some of this regret language? Yeah, I mean, like for the the word regret, so in the Genesis account where hey, he regrets that he made humanity, I mean, you can think, what are your options there? If he regretted in that he didn't know what was going to happen, well, then you have um, a finite God mm. who's not perfect in knowledge. I don't think we would want to say that. And why is that? Because there's plenty of other passages that outnumber mm. those verses by a significant amount that the Lord searches all things. He knows all things, that, 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 that his knowledge is perfect. So what I struggle with as it relates to like an open theist, Tim, the open theist will take the few verses and they'll limit God in his knowledge based on the few verses. Yeah. And they'll make the, 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 the more abundant verses about his inexhaustible knowledge. They'll make those verses submit to the limited amount of mm-hmm. verses. And I think if we interpret Scripture in light of Scripture, I think we should take the limited verses yeah. and say, yeah, th- this this can maybe sound like at first glance that maybe God didn't know what was going on here or uh, they, they, you know, that maybe he's changing his mind and what's going on here. Yeah. But you know what? I need to submit the fewer verses to the more abundant amount of uh, biblical data yeah. that would say that you know God knows full well. I mean, just think about what God was saying in advance about prophets. I mean, uh, you know, sending the prophets along. These people are going to do A. These people are going to do B. These people are going to do C. God knows A, B, and C. Right. Now, uh, by regret, I mean, it can just mean that he was just, that he he had sorrow. And so what's happening here is that God is, uh, you know, Utilizing anthropomorphic language. Okay. Anthropomorphic yeah. language is language that we use, uh, uh, and it's ascribing to God characteristics. And really, what I should say here, it's anthropopathism. Okay. And Ooh. anthropopathism yeah. is language of human emotions ascribed to God mm. so that we can relate to Him. Yeah. So it's kind of like we're imposing some of these human experiences, our emotions on God. So an anthropomorphism, it was describing God with human characteristics. Yeah. So like when the Bible says that, that the Lord stretched out his hand to heal, mm. well, humans have hands. God doesn't have hand. God is spirit. Anthropopathism refers to uh, emotions. And so it's 
it, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Like if God, God is not somebody we can relate to as easily. Yeah. Uh, you know, he is transcendent. Mm. He is imminent, uh, but he leverages some of these anthropopathisms and anthropomorphisms so that we can relate to him. Now, one final point is the first Samuel passage. Um, when we hear about, you know, uh, Saul, yeah. uh, if you go on later in that same chapter, so on one side, oh, the Lord regretted, but you go down later, the Lord is not one that he would regret right, in right. the same book. Right, right. So in the same chapter. Yeah. So yep. I would say we just have to interpret scripture in light of scripture. Yeah, no, excellent points. Um, one other thing that I, I might draw, and again, if I'm wrong here, you'll, you'll correct me, is that uh, people particularly God and us, can still have emotions even if we know what's going to happen. And I guess the example that I'm thinking of is if somebody's terminally ill, you know that that person is going to pass away in a short amount of time, but that doesn't change the emotion that you're going to have when they pass away. It may not be as deep because you'll be able to extend the morning out, but we see passages like Jesus wept when, when Lazarus died. He knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He even knew that uh, Lazarus was going to die for that exact purpose for him to be raised, but he still wept. He still had an emotional reaction to that. So I'm not sure if that plays into some of these uh, emotional you know, kind of yeah. things. He's just, he, he's saying, I knew it was going to happen, but I'm still sorrowful full of the, the, the given circumstances, if you will. So. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, we too, uh, if we lose um, our Christian loved ones, uh, we believe that we're going to see them again yeah. and we still weep. Or take, for example, a husband and wife, they're Christians. Both are dying of terminal cancer mm -hmm. um, and they're 90 years old and the husband has just died. Now, the wife... She knows that the doctors have told her she's got about a week or two left to live. Yeah. Okay. Would we think that she's crazy if she's weeping mm. uh, because of the fact that she knows that she's going to be with her husband in about a week? Right. right. Well, no, we would think that that's just part of being human. There's this compassion. So Jesus in taking on uh, human flesh in the incarnation, we see a wide range of emotions from uh, the emotion of feeling hungry, mm. um, the temptations. He says he was tempted in all our ways yet without sin. Yeah. Uh, we think about him being one uh, that would weep. Uh, we think about the compassion that he shows. So there's a swath of emotions that we can see with Jesus. I do think that uh, it's helpful because it gives us a nice picture of God in the flesh emoting. Uh, I guess a question that we, we would wonder about is, um, did him taking on human flesh um, change his emotional experience a little bit mm. as compared to uh, just existing with a divine nature? Yeah. So by having a human nature, um, you know, he obviously experienced some other levels of emotions, tiredness, right, right. Uh, growth, and things like that. Now that uh, said, when we think about God... We really set ourselves up to be disillusioned mm. when we look for a one to one correspondence with him. Okay, okay, God creates us and we're created in his image. Uh, and we got this relationship with God. And so, as Christians, we go out and we say, Oh man, I got a personal relationship with Jesus. And, and we do, uh, we have a personal relationship. But one way to set people up is we, we then start imposing on God the way that we would take care of each other, the way that we would relate to mm. one another, the way that we spend time together, well, we should start thinking, God's just like that, right? Like, yeah. man, go have a quiet time. It'll be unbelievable. Prayer is the most amazing thing in the world. And then you go pray, and you feel like your your prayers won't get above the ceiling. Yeah. You feel stood up. Uh, like, Tim, if I said, let's meet tomorrow for a cup of coffee, uh, guess what? You would show up at the time uh, that I said, and if you couldn't be there, you would send a text and say, man, Bobby, something came up. I can't. Right. Well, um, there's plenty of times if I think we're being honest, we go into prayer and you feel stood up. Yeah. You, yeah. you don't feel a connection. And if you were hurting, uh, something was bugging you. I, I would hug you. You would feel my touch, right? Like if, as yeah. I hugged, I'd brace you as my brother. Um, well, sometimes that is part of what we experience with the relationship to God. Yeah. It's very true. I mean, we know what it's like to sense the, the presence of God, yeah. this 
tingle of sorts. I, you don't need, it's, it's, it's something we can't even put into words. It's just, I know when I'm sensing the presence of totally. God. Yeah. But I also know what it's like to feel like, man, God, where are you? And for a yeah. while, um, I would feel disillusioned early mm-hmm. on as a Christian because so many Christians talk about how amazing it is. We'd be better off saying, you know, prayer is going to be like this. Um, it's something we do out of obedience, something we do out of faithfulness. Yeah. But don't expect God to always uh, le- let you sense his felt presence in prayer because yeah. he has a different way of developing us mm. than people do. So I sensed one time in my prayer, for example, God, where are you? I sensed he was more pleased with me because I stayed put in his presence, just telling him how great he is, how wonderful he was, even though it seemed like he was a million miles away. Yeah. Because anybody can pray and keep seeking when they got a spiritual buzz going. Right. But when he feels silent, when the door, when the ceilings of heaven feel closed up, that makes it more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great point. Let's keep talking about that a little bit more. And I think that what you just described often gets pushed into this realm of like fatherhood, right? So we, we get these clear passages where it's talking about that that God is our our heavenly Father. Jesus refers to Him as His heavenly Father. It's you know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But we don't always feel. Again, I think it goes back to what you're saying. We're saying if I was a father, I would do this. Uh, so therefore, if God's a father, He would also do something similar. He doesn't do that, and therefore I feel betrayed. Um, so how do we think about God as Father in our relationship with him? What do we need to keep in mind, particularly when it comes to things like evil or the problem of evil in the world and what what that looks like in our own lives? How do we need to think about that? Well, God knows ultimately uh, the goods that will come about uh, on difficult situations that we can't see, Mm. and we can entrust ourselves to him in that. I mean, you think about Jesus on the cross, you know, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. And he felt God forsaken in that moment. And yet Jesus, uh, you know, into your hands, right? I commit my spirit. He just kept trusting. Uh, He acknowledged the authenticity of the moment, uh, you know, why have you forsaken me? Uh, obviously, he was recalling Psalm 22. Yeah. Uh, at the same token, uh, we see him continuing to seek the Father out. Uh, Let this cup pass by me when he was in the garden. Nevertheless, not my will, but your be, be done. Yeah. For the joy set before me endured the cross. So there's an element where no one knew more suffering than the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. and no one had a more intimate relationship with the Father right. than Jesus. And so he was able to entrust himself to the Father. And I think that that's what we have to do as Christians. Sometimes life is going to throw us a lot of curveballs. Uh, it's going to be difficult. But here's what will mess people up more, is if we tell people, you're not going to suffer. God's always going to heal. He's always going to answer your prayers. Well, if, if we tell people that, then that might sound good at first. It might sound like the kind of father they want, but they're going to end up grossly disillusioned. Mm. But if we tell people that that ours is a father who allows us to go through things that we won't always understand this side of heaven. There will be times where um, it seems like he doesn't hear our prayers. There will be times we pray for healing and it will not be answered. Uh, there will be suffering that is is agonizing. But what you will see when all is said and done, that he was there. He didn't forsake us. He didn't leave us. Um, the, his greatest purpose is for us to grow in the image of Christ. And nothing is more fruitful in helping us to grow like Jesus mm. than these very trials that we think he needs to get rid of in our life. It's often those things that are most difficult for us that prove to be the thing that forge Christ-likeness into our life more than anything else. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's excellent to keep in mind. I mean, again, we're seeing this, this wave in our, our Christian culture of uh, you know people really buying into the idea that no bad will ever happen to them. You know, like there's just, you know, several preachers that are talking about that kind of thing. And I do think that there is abundant life in a relationship with Jesus, but it may not be what we always think about is going to be the pathway, right? You know, I'm yeah. thinking about that meme that says, you know, what success looks like. And it's kind of the the straight line as we go up, as we love Jesus, it's going to be more success. But really it's like these pits and valleys and we're going up and down. And all oh, that yeah. stuff. And so that, that's what I'm thinking about. Uh, let, let's maybe close this episode with uh, thinking about our our Mormon friends. And they'll point to a lot of these passages, you know, kind of all the passages that we talked about. And they'll say, look, it's clear through all of these passages that 
God is a man. He's a glorified man. He's Elohim. He's you know somewhere off in a distant planet. And they will use the, these types of verses that we're talking about. God is a loving father. You know, the, the hands, they're sitting at the right hand, stretching out his arm, the regret passages, the emotional type, emotional appeal passages. And they'll be like, it, it, it's clear. Where would you start with a Mormon other than, you know, we've said a lot already. So maybe, maybe you'll just reiterate some of the places that you would start. Where would you start with a Mormon to kind of point out the, the holiness, the set apartness of God, that he's not human mm-hmm. in, in, in that same sense, but that he is wholly other? Well, I would want to say too, that, that Mormons can be incredibly inconsistent. So for okay. example, I'd want to say, okay, so then what kind of human uh, is God or for that matter, what kind of animal? Mm. Uh, let's take Jesus for example. It, what do, what does he look like? Does he look like the Revelation one vision, <laughs> uh, right, where he's got long white hair, mm. or does he look like a lamb? Right. Is he a lamb <laughs> or is he a lion? Okay, okay, because yeah. uh, he, he's called the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. Yeah, or. Um, does he look like an angel because he's the pre-incarnate angel of the Lord? Mm. So what's going on here? Yeah. So I I would say, what about the Father? Right. I mean, uh, well, it, what does he what does he look like? Uh, you know, when the, the when the three messengers appeared to Abraham before Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, uh, he knew that he was encountering the Lord. Uh, what 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 did he see? Is that what God looks like? Yeah. Is that Yahweh? Um, what about the Holy Spirit then? Uh, is the Holy Spirit really a dove? Uh, <laughs> uh, is the Holy Spirit oil? Yeah. So all that to say, there's all kinds of images yeah. that God is depicted in. Mm. So we see him in different types of imagery. And so these then could be anthropomorphisms, yep. which uh, would be ascribing to God uh uh, you know, human characteristics right. or anthropopathisms, ascribing to God human emotions or zoomorphisms or zoomorphisms, right. which would be using like zoology, right, like right. a lion or a lamb. Yep. And so now God has animalistic characteristics. So I would say the Bible says that God is spirit and he obviously uh, can uh, take on various forms, Yeah, right? Uh, he hides Moses in the cleft of a rock and he passes by. Right. Um, he appears as a burning bush uh, yeah. f- uh, uh, alive. So uh, why is it that we're going to say God is a human but not a fire? <laughs> right, uh, right. Or what about the cloud that hovered above? Yeah. By, so what? these are different images. Yeah. With Jesus, you have an incarnation mm. where he truly takes on human form and and in the resurrection, we see that he has that body. And just as he went up to heaven, he's going to come again. So we believe in a bodily return of Jesus. Yeah. I, I think that it's just a failure to understand um, the, the figurative languages, metaphors, uh, similes, uh, and all of that. It's just poor biblical hermeneutics mm. that causes them to end up with some of these theories. No, I think that's a, that's an excellent point. That's a great place to start. I mean, you can even just ask them uh, in, you know, classic Greg Kokel fashion, like, we'll, we'll demonstrate where that is. And then you can look at the passages and then you can bring out these other passages that you're talking about and say, well, if if that's the case here, if you can draw that conclusion of, uh, you know, superhumanness, right, then how come you don't do it over here, over here in this passage or, there, you know, where those inconsistencies are? So I, I think that's great. Bobby, I think this is an excellent topic. I think it does tend to confuse a lot of people. And I think a lot of that is, is rooted in the philosophy that they're they're taught in church and the inability to read scripture in in this proper context. So, any final comments or thoughts you want to close us with today? Well, I'd encourage people maybe to get uh, "Living by the Book" by Prof. Howard Hendricks. Yeah. I had the privilege of studying under him at Dallas Theological Seminary, and uh, he had a wonderful uh, Bible study methods class mm. that. Uh, was just revered by so many people. He's since passed on now and is with the Lord, but it's a very user-friendly, simple book that can help people to understand Bible study methods, uh, to not approach the Bible in such a wooden, ultra-literalistic thing, but understand yeah. kind of the the Bible as literature and understand the different genres so that we can effectively uh, interpret God's word. No, excellent, excellent. Well, I would like to remind our listeners slash watchers one last time, we're on our road to 100,000 subscribers before the end of 2022 and we're trying to raise $25,000. So if you can be a part of either one of those, we would love for you to do that. And uh, we will meet you next time on The Unapologetic Show. 